The title of today's sermon is entitled, Perfect Harmony, Perfect at Oneness. That's Perfect Harmony, Perfect at Oneness. You know, I imagine Satan gets in an uproar as he understands all too well the meaning of God's holy days, especially the meaning of the Day of Atonement. And there are so many reasons to find joy in the Day of Atonement. It plays a pivotal role in humanity's success, leading into the next phase of God's master plan, the Feast of Tabernacles. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. But the truth of the matter is that without the Day of Atonement, a peaceful and prosperous millennium would never occur. So that's the reason why Satan needs to be bound and cast into the bottomless pits. One of Satan's main objectives when he is loose from the bottomless pit is to go out deceiving the nations in the four corners of the earth. Brethren, have you ever tried to build a relationship, repair, rebuild, reconcile a relationship with an individual who was full of pride, a big shot, self-righteous, or boastful? And if you have managed to achieve this great task by some means, would you consider this individual your best friend? Or even a close friend for that matter? What about even a good friend? Is there complete unity, complete harmony, or agreement, or at oneness in that relationship? I think that we would all agree that it's much easier to rebuild, repair, or reconcile with someone who is not prideful, self-righteous, or boastful. But someone who humbles themselves and swallows their pride, you can build upon that relationship, and in the present and throughout all eternity. During your own process of self-examination over the past year, how many prideful moments have you found yourself engaged in? How many prideful conversations have you caught yourself in or experienced during the last year, the last month, last week, or even the last 24 hours? Now, I would like for you to compare the number of times that you have humbled yourself during the past year. Is that a lot or is it a few? What if we could all visually see ourselves as God sees us? Imagine that you had a double pan balancing scale centered over a pivot joint. Now I would like for you to think of pride and humility as units of weight. In one pan you have pride, in the other pan you have godly humility. What would the scale look like? Would the scale be somewhat balanced? Or would it look like a seesaw with pride way up here and God humility way down here? If we have humility and it's way down here on the scale, then obviously some changes need to be made to shift the weight of that scale by humbling ourselves more often, drawing closer to God so that the heavier pan that holds our pride will begin to decrease as godly humility increases. And I know it's all a process, but humility is needed in order to have a harmonious relationship with Jesus Christ. And even then, our relationship requires a great deal of work and self-examination on our part. So today on this annual holy day, as we physically fast, drawing closer to God, humbling ourselves, think about something for a moment. God desires peace and harmony with man and has provided an avenue to restore that harmonious relationship, even after the separation caused by man's iniquities, which even is all the more reason for us to humble ourselves, because it could have gone the other way, with a man being wiped off from the face of the earth forever with no reconciliation. So with my remaining time left, let's look at God's love and desire to reconcile all of humanity back to him through Jesus Christ and have total at oneness with his creation, even though he was offended and we offended him by our iniquities. And maybe it would just cause us to reflect back even more, not only today, but continuously moving forward and kindle a flame of gratefulness and humbleness that would go before us to the end of our days and throughout eternity as spirit beings. Now, even though Satan shares much of the blame and is responsible for much of the world's evils, our iniquities has played a part in alienating us from God also. So today I hope to show that the same way Jesus Christ instructed us to handle offenses among one another, 
God, in a way, has taken that same approach toward us in reconciling God and man. He leads by example. He doesn't ask us to do anything he is not willing to do himself. And if we are paying attention, we can see the members of the Godhead have applied the same methodology in addressing the offenses made by each and every one of us. They are essentially doing the exact same thing that we are instructed to do, just on a much, much higher level. Let's go to Matthew 18 for a moment. That's Matthew 18 and beginning at verses 15. This verse talks about a restoration, a reconciliation or rebuilding of the relationship between brothers and sisters, flesh and blood, just like you and I. And before I read this verse, keep in mind that Jesus said that he had not spoken of his, in his own authority, but the father who sent him gave him a command what he should say and what he should speak. We need to understand that there was a complete harmony between both members of the Godhead as to what must be done in reconciling man back to God. Verse 15, moreover, if your brother, in our case, I would like to say potential brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, because part two of this step requires action on our part. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now let's stop right here for a moment. Who caused the enmity between the relationship between God and man? We did. Mankind's iniquity separated us from God and our sins had hidden his face from us so that he would not even hear us anymore. So what does the father do? He sends his only begotten son, a representative of the offending party to whom all things must be first reconciled to help us truly understand the severity of the damage done in that relationship. Remember, Jesus said in John 6 and 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. If it was not for Jesus Christ, we would never need, know to rec recognize the need to be reconciled to the Father. So Jesus Christ comes with a message. Ernest, Bill, Dave, Jonathan, Keith, I have a long-standing issue against you. You have committed an offense against God. My hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor my ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from God. This is the complaint. This is the offense. This is what we came to realize as the Father was calling us out of the world and our blindness were being removed, revealing to our hearts and mind the severity of the situation. Now let's look at part two, continuing on. If he hears you, you have gained a brother. Now let's examine this from the relationship of God and man. Jesus, if they listen to you and follow your instructions, if they hear you, if they hear the prophets, your apostles, on what needs to happen to make amends, then you have gained a brother. Brother, we all heard that complaint against us. It didn't go in one ear and out of the other, but instead we received it with gladness. We were responding repentance, baptism, and laying on of the hands for the receiving of God's Holy Spirit. So now we press forward leaving a, living a converted life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now guess what? Jesus Christ has gained brothers, he's gained sisters in all of us. But more importantly, we have gained an elder brother in Jesus Christ because we have truly been reconciled to the Father through Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice and priestly work which is still being done, done to this day as he continues to intercede for every one of us. So we see that God desires to be reconciled back to man, and I'm so glad he does because if God had no such desire, brother will be in a world of trouble. Is there any value or reward of being reconciled or at one with God? Brother, I would like to look at one of those rewards connected with reconciliation because there is a great indescribable joy awaiting all of those who are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice. If we turn over to the book of Colossians, beginning at verse 19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to, by, to, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, so we see that the process of reconciliation starts with Jesus Christ first. All things emanate through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. 
And you, you and I, once who were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. But why? To present you holy and blameless and above reproach. To present us holy to who, brethren? To who will we be presented holy? Who else but the Father? But notice, there's a stipulation. Verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel from which you heard. Notice, brethren, we must continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Jesus Christ is going to present you and I blameless before the Father. Now, that's totally mind-blowing considering our state, the current state of our condition. What an incredible, joyful, humbling moment in the progress of man on his journey to becoming a part of the God family. And I say progress because I'm sure we still will have more growing to do as children of God in the ultimate sense. In closing, John 17th chapter, Jesus Christ prayed for his disciples and all those who would believe in him through their word. And I like to refer to this prayer as a prayer of at oneness, a prayer of unity, a prayer of harmony. I won't go through all of this, but I would like to hear straight from the mouth of Jesus Christ, straight from the source, what his desire is for all of us and all of humanity. John 17, verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, speaking to his disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. We must stay united as the seal of the United Church of God says, united under one Lord, one faith, joined together by one baptism. Why? So that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. And you see this reoccurring theme and desire to be at one all the way through these verses. I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one. Total unity. And that the world may know that you have sent me, and I have loved them as you have loved me. The end of our enmity is to the glory of God. Every time I read through this passage of scripture, the only thing I can think or say is, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus Christ. In Amos 3 and 3, the question is asked, can two walk together unless they are agreed? What would you say about 3 or 4 or 15 or the whole world if they weren't agreed? It is only through Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice that perfect peace, perfect unity, perfect agreement, and reconciliation can be achieved. When the world truly becomes that one with the Father, with Jesus Christ, everyone will walk, everyone will live in total agreement. But it won't be by our power, neither by our might. It will be because greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Perfect harmony perfect at once.